Okay, sorry for all that confusion. I'll try to keep it short so people can get to lunch. First of all, <laughs> okay, that's right. First of all, happy birthday, Demos. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to all the organizers for having invited me, and uh, I couldn't possibly not come. <laughs> so, um, this, um, okay, so this is joint work with Vivek Borker, as you can see. Uh, I've worked with them quite, quite closely. But uh, let me just start out by giving you some idea of how I got to know Demos. Uh, this, I think, was the first year I got to know of Demos. Uh, I started to work closely with Praveen around this year. And one of the first things uh, he made me aware of was the work of Demos on uh, distributed and decentralized control. Uh, so 1984, as uh, you know well, is uh, associated with George Orwell. What you might not know is that it's actually um, also associated with control theory. So this is a direct quotation actually from uh, 1984. Who controls the past, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. Actually, I had the slide uh, particularly for Sanjoy, but he's, he's not around, but I may as well share the joke with you because uh, Sanjoy has a habit of talking about a quotation of Shannon. You might have heard him say this many times, which is that we can uh, uh, so know, the, know the past but not control it, but we can control the future and not know it. Uh, that quote is from Shannon, uh, from a paper in 1959. George Orwell wrote 1984 in 1949. <laughs> so, so George Orwell actually precedes Shannon in terms of understanding the relation between information and control by about 10 years. Uh, another thing I wanted to point out was that I just noticed this while I was preparing this talk is that 1984 is precisely 16 years before 2000. And 2016 is precisely 16 years after 2000. <laughs> so maybe the only thing that George Orwell got wrong was a sign. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So uh, in any case, so one of the first papers that uh, Praveen pointed out to me was this paper, which is, uh, I think it's a vastly understudied paper. So this is uh, one of the few papers that was actually mentioned earlier in this conference also by a couple of people, that um, uh, you know, all, essentially all we do in distributed control has to sort of deals with scenarios where all the agents are sharing the same probability model. And there's all these uh, mysterious phenomena that arise when you have uh, agents with different probability models. One of the phenomena, of course, is that people end up coming at an impasse, and that's also something you can associate with 2016, <laughs> so, or, or all the years that have gone by. So um, any case, so this, uh, this uh, awareness of, uh, of Demos's great interest in decentralized control uh, led me to want to work with him. And after we worked on these bandit problems with Praveen, we started to have discussions with Demos and Rajiv, who I think is still in the room. Yeah. So, um, so of course, we started working on bandit problems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Demos, presumably after you retire, this is what the University of Michigan is going to hand you in large bags. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, all, it's actually on, uh, on another computer, so you have all this. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you sent it to Barbara. Do you really want it sent to Barbara? <laughs> she, might, she might be taking you shopping very soon, so. <laughs> okay, so it's only the upper part. <laughs> okay, so, um, okay, so now to get to uh, what this talk is kind of about. So one of the things that showed up in our work with uh, Praveen and also with Demos, et cetera, is this, is this guy, which is the relative entropy. So of course, uh, relative entropy is normally thought of maybe as a concept that shows up in statistics and information theory. But anytime you have control scenarios that are stochastic and involve identification and learning and so on, relative entropy kind of shows up. And uh, this is going to be a theme in what I'm going to talk about today, in that you'll see that uh, relative entropy again shows up. So we'll re-encounter this beast. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is a control theoretic problem. And in this scenario, actually, the relative entropy perhaps shows up in a somewhat more mysterious way, although for people who are sufficient, <laughs> sufficiently cognizant of which I know there are many in the audience, everything looks obvious first <laughs> factor. So, so uh, let's get started. So actually, this, um, this talk starts with, uh, I guess the easiest way to introduce this circle of ideas is to start with this book of uh, Cover and Thomas. This is the second edition of the book on information theory. Most of us have either taught from this book or taken courses from this book. Um, one of the problems that you'll see in this book is the problem 4.16, 16th problem in chapter 4. 
And it studies the following example, asks you to sort of just sort of think about the following example. So you consider a set of binary strings, so uh, sequences of zeros and ones, with constraints. So uh, you constrain them to have at least one zero between every successive pair of ones and at most two zeros between every successive pair of ones. This is actually a fairly practical kind of constraint. So in magnetic recording systems, when they write uh, data on a disk, they impose these kinds of constraints. They're called run length constraints. And more generally, they're called DK constraints. So the one would be D and two would be K. So this is a well-motivated problem. It's not just a dream uh, sort of problem dreamt up to illustrate the theory. And the question that's asked here is uh, to study the growth rate of the number of such sequences. Uh, it's not hard to see that it doesn't really matter where you start, so assume that you start in one, for instance. And this is kind of interesting for information theorists, say for the coding, for the magnetic recording application, because it represents the available room, so to speak, or the amount of flexibility you have in encoding onto the disk. The more sequences you have, the more ability you have to, to encode more information. It's very easy to understand this, uh, how to approach this problem in graph theoretical terms. So you can draw some kind of a transition diagram like this. So for instance, the leftmost state would represent the scenario where you have just seen a one. And then after that, you have to see a zero, so there's only one place you can go to. So you have just seen a most recent zero with, one, with a one before that. Then you have an option. You can either go here, in which case you've seen two zeros, or, or you can go back. And once you're here, you have to go back because you've seen two zeros. So, so you're basically counting the number of parts in this graph. And let's say you start at that left node and you walk in the graph, you count the number of parts. OK, so um, once you see this, it's kind of easy to set this problem up. So you define a vector x, uh, which is an integer valued vector, a non-negative integer valued vector. It's intuitive meaning of x i n is the number of parts of length n that end in the state i. So in terms of the previous picture, the states are numbered from the left, 1, 2, 3. And uh, you get some kind of matrix. So you can imagine, for instance, if you're in the leftmost state, you have to go to the middle state. If you're in the middle state, you have the option of going up or down. That was what the previous picture looked like. And uh, you just uh, sort of uh, iterate this matrix. And uh, you're basically counting the number of parts, uh, assuming you started in the state 1. So this, uh, the growth rate then is basically the logarithm of the peron frobenius eigenvalue of A, so um, of course, uh, uh, you know, after one gets used to these things, they all start looking trivial, but there was a time when you didn't know what the Perron Rubinus eigenvalue was, and it's possible there are some students in the room who don't. I mean, I doubt it, but it's possible. So let's just define it. So this is what the, uh, by the way, it's astonishing, I, I, should, I should say that you might think that you know what the Perron Rubinus eigenvalue is, but I would challenge you to think carefully and be honest about whether you've actually ever read a proof of this. Right? <laughs> it's not necessarily that easy to prove the existence of Perron Frobenius eigenvalue. There's a proof in the book of uh, one of the volumes of Collins' book in the appendix, which I think lasts for about 14 pages. So it's a non-trivial proof. Any case, so the fact is, if you have an irreducible non-negative square matrix, uh, irreducible just means that you can walk from any coordinate to any other coordinate through non-zero non -zero coordinates. Then uh, there is an eigenvalue called the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue, uh, which, is a, a always, which is a positive eigenvalue that is at least as big as the absolute value of every eigenvalue. And it has some properties. So it admits uh, left and right eigenvectors that are unique up to scaling and would have strictly positive coordinates. And uh, the logarithm of this is what we saw in the previous example. OK, so this, uh, uh, this is an interesting. Um, number that characterizes some aspect of non-negative matrices. Uh, if you think about uh, some basic matrix stuff that we encounter a lot in all the things that we do as engineers and applied mathematicians or whatever, another uh, number that often shows up is uh, the uh, largest eigenvalue of a positive definite matrix. Right. So a positive definite matrix is a matrix that defines a quadratic form. Uh, I just take it to be real valued. Uh, have real value entries, a square matrix. And uh, we know that it then has um, non-negative eigenvalues. And the largest eigenvalue is uh, something sort of vaguely analogous, I suppose, to the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue. It's different context, completely different context. It's kind of a quadratic context. But one thing you might know is that this is connected with notions of energy and uh, you know, Lyapunov functions, all these sorts of uh, notions that come from harmonic analysis and lots of very interesting mathematics. 
And uh, if you think in the, along those lines, you, uh, and you probably encountered a formula for this largest eigenvalue, which is called the Courant-Fisher formula. And that's this formula here. Of course, we realize that A can be diagonalized. You can prove this formula for yourself using a much deeper theorem than you need for that, I suppose. And uh, the, this then might lead to the following question, right? So OK, here's a nice little characterization of the uh, largest eigenvalue of a positive definite matrix. I mean, is there uh, such a characterization for the Ferrand Frobenius eigenvalue of a non-negative matrix? Okay. Now, uh, you can think about it, but I guess I have to make progress. So, <laughs> so the answer is yes, and it's uh, something called the uh, <laughs> something called the Collatz Vland formula. I don't know if you've heard of this. Actually, it's not necessarily that widely known. And it's in some vague ways, it's like some L1, L infinity type characterization of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue of a non-negative matrix, uh, which is vaguely analogous to the Courant Fisher, because you have to think about these things to understand them properly. So in any case, this is a characterization of it that comes in two forms. So let me just read this out. So Aij is my matrix with non-negative entries d by d. So in the top form, you, uh, you imagine a, a column vector with all entries strictly positive. That's x. And you compute a times x. So it gives you a vector. And in each coordinate i, you divide by xi. And you take the minimum of those values. In the bottom form, uh, you do the same sort of thing. I mean, and then you take the super over x. In the bottom form, you do the same sort of thing, except you take the maximum of those values, and then you take the info over x. Now, you can actually understand this intuitively if you uh, just go through the mental process of pulling the row down and putting it to the denominator. And what, then you're dealing with a new matrix, which is aijxj divided by rho xi. And that's sort of like the transpose of a stochastic matrix. So what's really going on is that you're discovering the fact that the all ones vector is the eigenvector of a transpose of a stochastic matrix. So somehow the things have to balance out. And that's what this, uh, this result is telling you intuitively. OK, so this might be new. So already, maybe the talk is getting non slightly interesting. But uh, the point is that uh, uh, I sort of started out with this problem 4.16 in Kova's book. And Kova doesn't say anything about the Collatz Vland formula. Okay, It's not there in Kova Thomas. Many people know that. It goes on a different tack. So uh, what the Kova Thomas problem actually asks you to do is to recognize the connection between uh, path counting and uh, sort of Markov chain entropy rates. That's what this problem is trying to ask you to do. So it just asks you to do the following calculation. It says, OK, consider for that matrix that we, for this graph that we had, this kind of transition diagram, all possible transition probability matrices that are compatible with the diagram. To make this more uh, uh, sort of um, uh, aligned with traditional uh, notation, I've transposed the original matrix. So now the, what used to be a column there is now a row. And uh, here, basically, what happens is you have no choice when you're in the left state. So you have to put a probability 1. I mean, in the middle state, you can go either to the left or the right. So if you want a transition probability matrix compatible with that, you get to choose a number alpha between 0 and 1. You can go with probability alpha, probability 1 minus alpha. The, that state, you have to go uh, to the first state. So they have no choice there. So you have a one parameter problem. Each such matrix defines a Markov chain with state space 1, 2, 3. And that has an entropy rate. So I'm going to have to assume something. So I'll assume that you know what that means. So essentially, what that is is uh, you compute the joint entropy of, uh, a, say, a stationary sequence of random variables that have the law defined by this chain. Uh, and that grows linearly with the length. And you divide by n. That's called the entropy rate. So uh, the, uh, the point of this problem is it asks you to recognize that the maximum entropy rate of the Markov chain is precisely the logarithm of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue of that matrix A or equivalently of its transpose. OK, so, so now I mean, this is sort of, I'm just setting some pictures in, in place to, to explain what we proved. And uh, I'd like to introduce some notation. This is a somewhat peculiar notation for dealing with non-negative matrices. Uh, but it's, it's very relevant to what I'm going to say. So if I give you an irreducible non-negative d by d matrix, I'm going to write its entries in the following way. So first of all, I'm going to try to make the row vectors into a stochastic row vector. But then I'll have some scalar factor sitting around, scaling factor. I'm going to write that scaling factor as e to the rij. It's just some notation. And this notation for probability distributions on some set d, which is basically the coordinates of the vectors. And this is probability distributions on arrays d by d arrays. All right, so um, now here I'm going to tell you something that uh, is um, probably belongs to the subject of large deviations theory. 
And uh, this is one of the uh, results that sort of uh, got people very interested in this subject. Of course, large deviation theory is a big discovery that connects up many ideas from physics and uh, statistical mechanics and Markov chain theory, et cetera, in one broad, broad framework. But one of the sort of um, amazing things discovered in the process of the development of this theory by, uh, mostly by Vardhan and in this result also by Donsker, is this characterization of the uh, peron Frobenius eigenvalue of a non-negative matrix. So this is actually a strange way of writing this characterization. And um, this uh, is written this way because I want to align it to the notation that I introduced for the Aij. Uh, I mean, normally what you would do is you would write this Rij as a log of e to the Rij, and then you would pull the log in here, and then you would have the e to the Rij coming here, and then you would just have the Aij sitting around. But what this tells you is, if you know a little bit about conjugate duality, convex duality, etc., this is expressing the log of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue thought of as a function on the space of non-negative matrices as the conjugate dual of the relative entropy. It's exactly what it's doing because this is, a, this is something called the relative entropy. So again, I'm assuming some things. So uh, uh, let me just explain what that means. So this formula, if you know what entropy is, then you kind of know what this kind of formula is. So this is expressing the uh, entropy, relative entropy distance. Actually, I had the notation already, the dpq distance between this probability distribution for the row index sort of condition on i indexed by j relative to the pji. So the relative entropy of the eta i with eta 1 with respect to p, and then you average that over some probability distribution on rows, which is eta 0 of i. This is the relative entropy between some kind of matrix of numbers of the form eta 0 i, eta 1 j given i, relative to uh, this pji, which is a bunch of conditional probabilities. And this turns out to be a convex in the eta thought of as a variable. And then you're doing the usual conjugate duality. So you think of this as a dual variable in a product eta, and you take the max. Okay? So this is a characterization of the logarithm of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue as a function on the space of non-negative matrices. And it turns out to be a convex function. It's an amazing discovery. It's part of the whole subject of the large deviations theory. And in fact, this Okay, Coran Thomas just tells you to do this calculation and verify that the two numbers you get are the same. But the proof actually is sort of built into this. And you can do this by uh, the, the fact that the entropy rate, when you optimize over the alpha, turns out to be uh, the log of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue is, is, in that example, is just an instance of this general fact, which you can discover by taking Pji to be, say, 1 over the degree of i. Okay. So um, now, I'm going to prove uh, Donska and Vardhan to you. <laughs> okay. and this, I think, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure this is known in the literature, but this is part of what goes into what I eventually want to convey. And I really hope I don't go over time. Uh, okay, so uh, this is. Not, I'm going to walk you through this proof. This is a proof of the Donska Vardhan result for finite d by d. I mean, all this can be done more generally, and in fact, some of it we do more generally. But uh, just consider d by d non-negative matrices, and that formula of Donska and Vardhan is a consequence of the Colatz VLAN formula. So let's walk through that. So uh, I take one of the versions of the Colatz VLAN formula, which is up here. So this is the, uh, basically, remember that uh, characterization of the Perron Frobenius eigenvalue as the, uh, you, you let x vary over strictly positive vectors. For each such fixed vector, you consider this ratio, which is parameterized by i. You take the max, and you, then you take the inf over xi. So what you can do, of course, is you're taking a max over the i. So you may as well convexify and take the soup over probability distributions on i. So that's what the first step does. And I've also introduced this weird notation where aij has been written as e to the rij pj given i. Okay. Now what I do is I um, uh, take this uh, xi and I convert it into log of xi. So I want to shove it into the exponent. So there's a log xj from the xj and a minus log xi from the xi that sits down here. And uh, then I want to take logs. So um, logs are uh, monotone. I'm also changing notation in that when I take log of xi, I write it as u. So x was non-negative, in fact, strictly positive. u is now real. So now I have an info over real u, soup over gamma. and I decided to write a formula for log of rho instead of just rho. So all I've done is just some simple manipulations. I have this last formula in red because I wanted to show up on the next page. So the very same formula is now written on the next page. The very same formula in red. Okay. 
Now I'm going to do some uh, slightly more interesting things. That's right. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm using standard conjugate duality for, for e to the x, right? So I'm writing basically e of e to the theta in terms of the standard conjugate duality. So I'm doing that in terms of a, of a variable eta. So, so I'm thinking of this as some kind of a, of a, of a x, sort of e of e to the theta times this kind of matrix, coordinate by coordinate. And I'm writing that using the traditional conjugate duality, which you see in Chernoff's theorem, et cetera, in terms of a bunch of dual variables, which are the eta ij. So that's the key step. Okay. So I do that here. Yeah, no, I mean, this is just traditional. This is just a bunch of things indexed by pairs, and it's e of e to the theta. No, so it's traditional conjugate. But this is a key step that sort of brings in the conjugate duality into place. Okay, so now, now what I do here is I basically do a min max, right? Because uh, it, this is amenable to min max, the soup and the inf. You can just, just check the, uh, the structure of the objective in here. So I do the min max. So I've got this in this form. And I also do one more thing is I separate out this term into two pieces. So I pull out a piece which is, so eta 0 is like the, the i marginal of it. So I, I pull the gamma with that. And then this, uh, whatever is left, I write it in terms of eta 0 and eta 1. Okay. Now I've got a soup over the gamma out here. And the only place the gamma shows up is here. This is a relative entropy, so it's non-negative. So if I want to take the soup, I want to make the gamma equal to eta and kill this. So gamma dies. That's why it's in blue. So this term is dead. Okay. The only proof, by the way, and this, the point of doing this is so that I can state a much broader theorem without having to go through the proof. Everything is sort of already been reviewed, and it's going to show up in the Sam Journal of Control, so hopefully it's correct. Okay. So okay, here's, here's uh, I've killed the blue guy, so just to show you where we are. The blue guy is gone, and that was the only place gamma showed up, so I'm just left with what's left here. So I now have, oops, uh, I now have uh, the, just the soup over eta and the inf over u of everything in here. Now here I make the following observation, is that unless eta has the property that it, it gives you the same sum over the uj as over the ui, you can adjust the u to make this part of it go down to minus infinity. So there's no, there's, there's, uh, so I'm only interested in those etas which belong to a set which I'll call g tilde, which are basically the joint distributions in ij, which have the property that the i marginal is the same as the j marginal. Namely that it's some kind of stationary distribution framework where the uh, thing, it looks like a little piece of a stationary Markov chain. So that's g tilde, and that is donsko -Varden. Okay, so this is a proof of Donsko Varden from Colat's VLAND. I've not seen this explicitly written down, but I'm sure it's there. I mean, if you look at Dembo's Zaituni and you think for a half an hour, you'll probably find this proof. Yeah. So this is basically computing the cost for uh, an risk sensitive Yeah, so the risk sensitive. That's what's going to happen, yeah. So you're, you're a few minutes ahead of me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I mean. That's the title is about risk sensitive, so that's, that's really what's going to happen. And uh, we're sort of going there in, uh, in a certain context. Um, and um, so, so let me now uh, get to control. So you've provided the right segue. So Boerker, as you know, one of the, one of the things that he's uh, famous for uh, is being one of the main contributors to the development of the ergodic approach to control. The ergodic approach to control is basically, uh, some, it stands in duality to the dynamic programming equations of control in the average cost case. And the point is that you can think about the control uh, uh, performance in terms of just some stationary scenario where you just talk about some kind of occupation measure on pairs of states and controls. And this is some language for doing that in this limited discrete case in which I'm presenting this talk. So uh, here's, the, here's some control problem. I have a state space. I have a, a control set, which is, a, which is also drawn from some finite set of possibilities. Control transition property matrix. Assume irreducibility to get rid of technicalities. Think of some one-step reward function, which I choose to write as a function of the present state, the next state, and the current action. I wish to do long-term average, so I take the soup over all possible adapted strategies of the long-run reward. And uh, I want to discuss how, with how this sort of grows, in the, I mean, it grows linearly with the, with the length, so that's the performance that I'm interested in. Here's the ergodic characterization. So consider all possible stationary distributions, that is, uh, uh, Occupation measures on i, u, j, which have this invariance property that uh, the margin on i is equal to the margin on j. And simply imagine maximizing the expected reward you get over such an occupation measure. And that's going to be your, uh, your objective. So this standard stuff in ergodic control. And this is precisely the LP dual of this set of equations. Okay. 
Now, risk sensitivity, right? So Jan has already s seen where we are going. So I, I just want to motivate risk sensitivity because this version, I mean, risk sensitive control is actually a kind of a weird thing. I think mostly attributed to Vittel, I think. I'm not sure about history. I don't care about history, honestly, but <laughs> somehow. <laughs> No, no, but this, the, the try to uh, see this as a way of addressing risk. So perhaps you have a better sense of who I should attribute it to. No, but in, in terms of risk sense, it comes from efficiency. No, no, in, yeah, in the broader sense. But what? Yeah, what people consider risk sensitive today, uh, as, I mean, as a way of addressing what one way of addressing what one wants to mean by risk through this large deviations approach is, I think it's probably vital, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so um, the point of risk sensitive control is to try to incorporate some aspects of the variance of your reward into, into, the, uh, into your objective. And uh, basically what you'd like to do is, uh, is to uh, either penalize or seek reward, seek, uh, seek variance. If you're penalizing variance, then you're risk averse. There's a minus sign here. If you're seeking variance, you're risk seeking. Now, the problem is that if you just directly try to incorporate the variance, it's not very compatible with Markovian dynamics. So what people in control theory? Yeah, I, I'm going there. That's, uh, the next slide is basically uh, is, is <laughs> indicating, is indicating what, what people do, right? No, no, I, 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 this is, uh, it's very important to motivate why people do things the way they do. That's why I have these couple of slides. So uh, the point is somehow that the variance is not very compatible with Markov decision theory, but large deviations is. So the, uh, what, pe what, the, what passes for risk sensitive control in the control community is to uh, accept this kind of a approximation which is to uh, go through the uh, Taylor series expansion of the exponential. So if you take the ex ex expectation of some exponential like this, you just uh, pull out the, the expectation, and then you want to discuss the variance around the expectation, and you just take a Taylor series expansion for the, exponent and the, for the exponential there, and you sort of see that you can roughly think about the uh, penalizing the variance as dealing with the log moment generating function appropriately scaled. And then you decide, OK, so uh, I'm going to discuss the scenario where theta is positive, And instead of discussing the, the uh, optimizing this, I try to optimize this, and vice versa. So this is risk seeking. Now, the, what we're going to discuss, the result that we have is corresponds to the risk seeking case, which is the portfolio case. So we are discussing, basically, a maximization problem for an exponential of this sort. Okay, so now I can say the results. All the, all the hard stuff is done, okay? I just want to say where we're going. So this is a problem that we studied. Again, I'm still in the non-technical scenario here. We have broader results, which I'll formalize and, and I'll explain the basis for. And, uh, okay, not too bad. I, I guess I started quite late, so I should, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should be done in about seven or eight minutes, hopefully. <laughs> now, uh, so this is a risk-sensitive control problem in the framework that we have. So just like the ergodic cost problem, Finite state, finite action set, uh, uh, con transition probabilities, uh, controlled Markov chain, assume a reducibility, one step reward, et cetera. But now what we want to do is to study the risk sensitive reward. So we are going to try over all possible policies to discuss uh, the limit of this quantity, and we'd like to basically make it big, right? So uh, this is now what control, some parts of the control community would call the risk sensitive control problem. And this growth rate, we have a log, remember, in here, is basically some, what, something that we'd like to characterize. Okay. Now, we have, now here's, the, here's the result that we actually have. So we, uh, we, we have allow you to have a compact metric space as your state space, a compact metric space as your control space. The uh, control Markov chain is defined by kernel. So it's a conditional probability on the state space given the current state and the current action. Uh, topology, topology V convergence. Uh, reward is some finite possibly exactly equal to minus infinity object, which is thought of as function of the current state, the current action, and the next state. Causal control strategies are defined in the usual way. That is, uh, at any given time, after having seen the end past controls and actions, you can, and the current state, you can basically choose how to choose your control. But compactness is critical. We don't know how to go beyond compactness. Aim is to, minim is to do this. So we, want to, uh, we have a supremum of initial conditions because we don't want to worry about, uh, you know, I mean, you could do it, but you don't want to worry about separations into, into subsets and so on. And calligraphic A is a set of all randomized control strategies. We want to characterize this growth rate. 
Okay, some technical assumptions. So we're going to have to assume that the e to the r is continuous. r is allowed to be minus infinity, e to the r is zero, no problem, so last one zeros. Uh, we're going to assume an equicontinuity condition on the kernel, so this is some kind of nice continuity condition on the kernel. And this is the most general scenario, of course, to arrive at this, you have to go through a step where you assume strict positivity and take do a limiting argument. So first we do this case, which is like the all positive case and the non-negative thing, and then we go to the limit. Okay. What are the results? So first main result. So the, everything uh, boils down to actually uh, some facts about the, uh, about the pullback operator, the linear operator that shows up in all of dynamic programming which is that you take an arbitrary function in the state space and you pull it back through this controlled kernel, taking the soup over all possible ways of choosing the control, you get T of F. And the main observation somehow, which connects to the earlier peron frobenius business is that you should think about this operator as a positive operator which uh, acts on the cone of non-negative functions. So uh, if you have non-negative functions, they get pulled back, so there's something about this operator which is positive operator technical sense preserving a cone or pulling a cone into itself. And uh, first theorem is, this is, in some sense this is not really our theorem in that, you know, this is buried in the literature, but we brought bringing this into our context. Under the assumptions, the stronger assumptions, A0 plus and A1 plus, such an operator admits a unique largest eigenvalue, which is strictly positive, associated with an eigenvector, which is now a function on this space of continuous functions, in fact, in the interior. So in any case, this, this, this can be considered the peron frobenius eigenvalue, okay? And this belongs to a subject of something, I'm going to put the right words up there so you can see how this connects to the literature. So this is a theorem that I'll give you exact references, but this is uh, somehow the dynamic programming operator as it shows up in traditional theory, and it has this property. And um, our first main result, so this in some sense is our result, although it's kind of dragged out of the literature, is that there is a Colatz VLAN formula for this, for this row, which, uh, which is the scaling factor for the fixed point or the Perron frobenius eigenvalue, as you wish. So, um, uh, and it has both the forms, right? So uh, the mu here is playing the role of, the, um, of these coordinates, I guess, and the f is playing the role of what we had as x. So there's an inf soup form and a soup inf form. And so this, uh, this is a characterization of that row that shows up from that earlier result the versions of the Perron from Yazagibari. So our basic result in some sense is that the lambda, which is the control, the growth rate risk sensitive control is a log of this object. Now, but it's more true than that. So that's, this is really, uh, I, this, this is us, I mean, in the sense that here's the explicit formula for that lambda. So as a, a reason I went through in some gory detail the way to derive Donsko Vardhan from Kolatz VLAND is to point out that once you get the Kolatz VLAND, you can go to the whole shebang as long as you're technically sort of honest, and you can get the analog of Donsko Vardhan. Now this has amazing conceptual implications, okay? In some vague way, you know, there's the work of Todorov and so on, but it's not Todorov. Todorov sort of imposes this from above. This is a, a, a Direct, there's a proof of the fact that you can think of risk sensitive control objective as some kind of relative entropy penalized version of the traditional ergodic cost problem. So this is our result. So in some sense, if you're doing the soup without all this jazz, you're doing the ergodic control version of the traditional linear cost. And when you throw in a relative entropy penalty on occupation measures, and you go to the soup, you're basically doing risk sensitive control. That's the setup. Of course, the R has different meanings in the two contexts, so please don't get confused, right? The R there has something linear. Here it's the E to the R coming with the kernel, et cetera. Anyway, this is our main result. And this generalizes Donsko Vardhan, and it specializes to Donsko Vardhan when you go away from the control. You drop all the control variables, you have Donsko Vardhan. So the generalization of Donsko Vardhan. Structure of the proof, well, so the Collatz VLAN formula that I wrote down earlier is, uh, comes from that result. That result itself is something which the literature calls a nonlinear krein rutman theorem. krein rutman theorems are theorems that are generalizations of the peron frobenius type of result to the case of cones, but for linear, linear cones. And there's an enormous literature, there's a whole book on non-negative operators actually, which you can read a lot about, and might potentially have lots of impact in applied areas. Nonlinear krein rutman theorems is a very, very uh, dangerous area to venture into. There are at least three wrong papers that we encountered. Uh, we had discussions with Arapostasis and uh, Borker and all that, and there are wrong results in literature. So you really have to work your way around. It's a minefield of results. But we're pretty sure that the result that we are appealing to is correct because we've checked all the details. It's a result by someone called Ogiwara, who works in Japan. 
and that's the result that leads to the Collatz VLAN formula. And um, okay, this is just fancy word for dynamic programming, right? Dalman Nisio semi group in the general case. So somehow this dynamic programming principle is 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 in, is built into that operator T that I wrote down. And when you apply the nonlinear Kronenbergian theorem to it, you somehow end up with the Collatz VLAN formula. So you see the again, the point. Yeah, the absolutely. Absolutely, no, no, I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I agree that it should be called a fixed point. I don't object to that. But I was just trying to justify the potential that calling it an eigenvector also because of that mental <laughs> picture, so. Eigenfunction. Eigenfunction, and, but the rho is, uh, I mean, okay. Rho is the eigenvalue. Yeah, eigenvalue, so that's what, that's what I was saying, yeah, right. Yeah, but it's true that in general you might not be able to define it. <laughs> okay, all right, so I mean, it's, it's sorry? No, no, no. <laughs> Um, let's say I mean I, let's say I, I, I suppose I have a nonlinear operator. I decide that I decide to define an eigenvalue eigenvalue of a nonlinear operator be any number for which there exists a psi such that uh, t psi equals that. I mean I could make that definite. I agree with you that it's it's uh, not capturing anything for nonlinear operators in general. So. <laughs> okay. So anyway, almost done. So okay. So this is this is the idea. And uh, so uh, to get to the level of A0 and A1, that is to get rid of the strict positive assumptions, you have to take a limit. So that's a perturbation argument by changing the kernel a bit. All that is worked out in the paper. So uh, this is the nonlinear Kronenbergian theorem of Guevara. You probably don't want to see this very much, but it gives you a general picture. So basically, if you have Banach space, which has a closed convex cone in it, and uh, you have some kind of a nonlinear mapping, which has certain properties, uh, so strong positivity, homogeneity, so that it sort of acts in a cone-like way. And uh, then, uh, under some technical conditions, you can show the existence of that row and the corresponding, so this is the exact theorem. Compact, strongly positive, you have to see what all this means, you have to go through the literature, then there exists blah, blah, and the mental picture is that the cone sort of shrinks down to a vector, and the vector scales in the limit, and the scaling factor is the eigenvalue. Now, some applications. So actually, this was one of our motivations. So we're thinking, okay, suppose you're doing the magnetic recording application, and you have a bunch of different potential, uh, so you have a parameter that can change the kind of constraints that you want to apply to the sequence, right? And uh, so how would you sort of maybe control that parameter in order to maximize the space in which you can put sequences in? This, uh, magnetic recording, is, a, is, a, is, this is these things are actually used, and in fact, there was even work of uh, Brian Marcus and uh, uh, Hasner and Coppersmith and so on, uh, studying how you actually encode uh, raw data at an entropy rate that is below the available entropy rate in a way that is finitary, that gives you sequences, etc. So it might be interesting in, in those kinds of applied contexts. So in any case, a, a consequence of our result is that what replaces the entropy rate is a kind of controlled conditional entropy rate. I'll, I'll wrap up because I know everyone should get to lunch. So one of the results. Another application that Borker is interested in particularly, it belongs to this whole business of gossip and uh, things of that sort in the control community. And uh, so he's studying the problem of um, trying to maximize the time at which you exit out of some subset of states in some kind of a control Markov chain scenario. So rather than uh, try to sort of be precise about the notation here, here's the mental picture. So let's say that you want to try to maximize the hitting time of a certain subset S0 of states in some control Markov chain kind of scenario by the choice of control. So you want to spend as much time as possible in some region. Well, you can convert that into a problem this kind because the exit probabilities can basically be rewritten as if they look like some kind of risk sensitive objective with the log being thrown in here. And then you can basically find out what the best thing to do is. Okay, so what are the main, this is last slide, except for the picture of Berkeley. And uh, main thing that we don't know how to do anything about is how to remove the compactness assumptions, which is probably quite important for applications. And then continuous time, right? We know nothing about continuous time. There's a kind of a version of a collapse VLAN formula that Borka has with Arapostasis and Suresh Kumar uh, that actually predated the work that we did. And so it uses somewhat different techniques, but it's, uh, it's just trying to get at the collapse VLAN. It hasn't gone through the collapse VLAN to Donsko Varadhan. So punchline is basically that we've generalized Donsko Varadhan, and we have a very sort of a clear c a characterization of the risk sensitive reward as the uh, maximization of a concave function or a convex set, which is not necessarily an easy problem, but it's, it's explicit, and that's it. <laughs> Happy birthday, Dinas. <laughs> we tested uh, tens of thousands of cases because it's very easy computation. You have a clearing system. By just, uh, we use a random number generator to create values for the parameters and check what happened. So what we saw is that